just tidying up the truck and about to put some frames together quickly, uh, waxing them up. Uh, but I just wanted to show you this. Um, this is a hide that I made over 12, 13 years ago. When I started beekeeping, number seven, hive number seven, it's finally has to go. Now we all get this and it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's had a lot of bees in it over the years. You can say even made the frame spaces underneath with U-clips, I hammered them in, worked out where the frames went and it's had a lot of use. So to me, this hive has done its job. And I just wanted to point out that hives don't last forever. Uh, I have seen some of Bob Binney's and people are wax dipping now, which seems to be the ultimate treatment. If you can wax dip your hives, do so. If you are buying good wood, resinous, marine ply hives, well, not even marine ply, marine pine, I mean, um, like we call it maritime pine here. If you get hives that are quite nice and resinous, they can last even longer. I think Bob Binney had some that were like 40, 40 years old, old. I do know that uh, my ex-colleague Christian had some uh, Vuano hives that he bought off a guy when he first started and they were already over 40 years old and they were like uh, much thicker. They were like almost an inch thick wood where the hives we have these days are a, a little bit less but they were probably 60 years old as well. I mean, it's just a kind of initial treatment over the first few years. If they're allowed to, to cure well and the wood can season well, and then you treat it after, that to me is when it seems that they will last a long time. But anyway, I'm not upset about it. It's just time to put this to the fire because it's got dry rot and wet rot probably as well. You don't necessarily want to have that near your other hives either, like stack next to it because it can spread the fungi the dry rot through into your next side of hives. So be a kind of a bit aware of having hives that are on the way out. And if you can remove one or two, uh, do so, because it, you get that out of the system. So what I'm doing today is I'm actually gonna be using my hives that are outside when I put nukes into hives. I'm gonna use these ones up first. And the nice thing is, so I'll be taking a few of them. I took a few down yesterday as well. When those are used up, I'll be using the ones I've got in here. So I'll actually be emptying out quite a lot of my stock this year. And all those that are stacked on the pallet racking for now, they were stacked by hand. Uh, they will be used as much as possible this year as well. You can see I've got number six here, <laughs> which is actually in considerably much better condition. But I don't know why, maybe because the pine I made that of, was it was literally some old church tables I got and they were really light pine. So I think that's probably why that has degraded so quickly. But 10 years, 11 years isn't quickly really. Uh, that's done a good life. So my other hives I've got here, just to give you some background, I actually bought these and I bought, that's a very resinous one. And I know this because when I put these together, I used these big screws. So I know that the ones that are in this type are really resinous and they're absolutely solid. I bought 50 hives like that. And I bought another load more recently, a couple of, about six years ago, that were put together at the shop. So I've repaired that one at the top, you can see, because it cracked, actually got hit by a farmer, and I've repaired that, but overall they're all solid as a rock. Not very happy to see the odd nail coming out, but it's something you just keep an eye on. Um, this one, for example, this is one of the early ones as well. I think this is on the way out, so I'll put this to the side. Sometimes old hives are actually good to use to put on their sides. If you've got three or four of them, you can, you can stack things on them. In other words, like a little apothecary set. But all these hives, if I can, I'll repaint them as well, but I don't know if I'm gonna have time for that. But this is all I've got left. So I've got uh, tw uh, four, eight, uh, nine, 10, uh, about 35 hives there and about 25 outside still. So I'm gonna almost use up all my boxes, which is brilliant. And if I can get hold of a few more brood boxes in the next year or so, because I want to try and keep my overall hives up to about 250 hives with a few boxes every year coming in as new. And that's the skill to it is you need to rotate the boxes. You need to bring some back over the winter, change the bases, clean them out. And in, in a normal beekeeping outfit, that happens naturally, I find. 
because you do have hives that die out. You bring them home in the autumn if you can, then it gives you time to repaint them, clean them, and then they go back into the system clean. So, as I said, that box that's, that's dead is just natural wastage. It's normal. You have to expect that, and that's what beekeeping is. You have to reinvest all the time. But I'm also a bit alarmed now because I actually haven't got as many boxes as I think, as I hoped. So what I could do is fill all the boxes I've got and then I could split the nukes that I've got and split them, take three frames out and put another three frames in and take the other part away. Make sure they've got a queen if they find a queen cell and leave them make a new one. Just look at this now. This is the morning after I filmed that video and look at it now, it's completely different. The wind's dropped a bit. We have much nicer weather and that is blindingly yellow. We will probably have the rapeseed around for another week to 10 days, I reckon, to give nectar. But the other spring flowers are on their way. So that's good. So regarding the building, quick update on that. Uh, I'm gonna be ordering the next section of the pallet racking to just finish that last bit off to just halfway to just in front of the uh, that's that vertical piece of metal there, that's gonna be where that last section will be. And that will give me enough room for a pallet and a half and other stuff. So I could put two things of syrup on the lower one or stuff like that. But what I'm saying is that will use that last blue racking there that I cable tied to the other one for now for safety, but that will use that and put that in its place. And then from then on, that's where the mezzanine's gonna go right the way down this whole double room. So I've been doing a lot of work. I've been checking, you see I've still got the tape measure down here all the way along the floor. I've been measuring out, checking everything for the two quotes I've had for that. And that is actually, the prices that has actually gone down very slightly. So the mezzanine will come to, uh, it'll be a big, it's very difficult to explain. So I'm gonna show you on a, plan now, an overview from the top, okay? So the reason why I'm starting at halfway in that second bay there, just there, okay, which we'll see on the drawing now, is because that's where the end of the extraction room will be, okay? So there'll be a big double door there, sliding door from the outside, or maybe from the inside, I'm not sure what yet to do, that will slide that way going across. Then coming down here, this will be the central corridor and there'll be a big door here, just here. And that will slide because that's one of the pillars for the mezzanine as well. And it will slide across here and open that way. I don't know if that's possible to get some idea. So that's about a meter 20, meter 40 wide, I think it is. And inside here, there'll be another double door which slides this way across. So this will be the warming room. It's just to recap things for you so you get some idea. But that will be the main room there for the warming room and the main extraction room will be this side. So everything is in place. So I've actually been doing a lot of work. The reason why I'm just going through this again, just to say as well, that's obviously still gonna be an office and it's gonna be storage and it's gonna be a workroom in the winter, I think now, and the toilet and shower and stuff like that at the back. So that's gonna be a separate unit done as well. But the reason why I wanted to run that through with you is just to talk about the mezzanine more. So extremely badly, this is a, uh, a kind of architect's drawing of the overall um, mezzanine. Um, you can see it starts there halfway between one, two, three, and that's the fourth beam there. So what I wanted to show was that there doesn't correlate very well in this picture. So I'll show you this. So this is basically the floor plan of the whole area. So there is the entrance to under the mezzanine, the main entrance. So then you go inside there and you will go through that door. That takes you to the extraction room as a whole. There's the extraction line there and you go into the warming room there. So that door slides that way. If that's clear, that door can slide that way, open and close. That door comes right across this way, open and close. And the beams are all in place to do that. And then when you exit, the whole idea is you'll load your honey 
through the machine here. The pallets can come along here empty, and then we load the empty frames back onto the pallets and out this door afterwards in that kind of fashion. Or we can store the honey into the warming room. And then this is the area that will have all my, uh, like the center of the works. We would say like a control room. So that's where my heat pump exchange unit will be. And the other things like underfloor heating valves, all that will be there as well as um, internet stuff, power. That's the main power grid will come into there as well and distributed through that part. This is the toilet area and there'll be uh, a shower in there and a changing room. And this side will be an office facing out that way with a window out that way. But this bit here is that square there roughly is under the mezzanine as well. But this whole area is mezzanine and the steps come down that way. So these are the steps here that will go from there downwards. There may be some change of that. I may put the steps somewhere else, okay? I may put them um, crazily enough to the middle here. Then that would leave you more headroom when you come up. We just don't quite know yet because we haven't worked out the height when you arrive at the top there, whether it's gonna be underneath the beam, but it won't be because the beam with the cross piece is just there. So I think it's gonna work quite well. But it just gives you some idea as an overview of the size of the mezzanine, how it's going to kind of work. And then that will be the plan inside and the plan of flow. So you'll be able to reverse my truck in here, unload pallets, unload supers onto pallets, proceed with them either into the warming room or then straight into the machine, blah, blah, blah. But that's the general plan. And obviously my pallet racking already goes along that section. And that's where the last piece will go into there. So it's only just gonna fit, but it'll work really well. So there you go, that's just some overview of the actual um, mezzanine and how that is gonna work roughly. So there's a lot to just wiggle around, jiggle around with it, but I'm pretty sure that's how it's gonna look when it's finished. So I've been doing some quotes on the mezzanine. I've had quotes already. They've come back a little bit cheaper because we had to redo them for purposes of a grant. But then we've discovered little things that I didn't think of. And one of the things was the charge load. So at the moment, the quote I've got is for the mezzanine to only hold 300 kilos per square meter. Now that might not sound a lot, but that's my concern is that we've got to up that a bit. We need to have about 400 to 450 kilograms a square meter on the mezzanine. But the great thing is the mezzanine will almost increase my whole surface floor area by a half. And I've been working out all the dimensions, the height, because what I'm talking about today is we are going to get one of these. This is like really exciting for me because this is a big boy's toy. So this is a Gerber or a pallet lift that will change my workshop in terms of manual handling. So the objective of that machine, the reason why I need it and I want it so I can first of all unload heavy things from my truck like syrup. So I put a pallet, so for instance, say I drive home with uh, syrup now that I did the other day. I'll put my pallet, my original pallet mover on the truck, the manual one, the small one on the truck. I then maneuver around the the, the syrup to where the pallet is on the edge. Then I can drive my forks up to the pallet when the sides of the truck are down and then lift that off. So the pallet machine I'm getting will take approximately 1.2 tons. And that's more than I need because for instance, a pallet of glass, I think I've got a measurement here on one of these pallets, but a pallet of glass weighs approximately, there you go, that's one of them there, weighs approximately, 390, 400 kilos. The smaller glass jars weigh a little bit more. So I've had to look at the weights I'm gonna be handling. I've had to look at my expectations. And the thing is what I would like to do is be able to lift off a pallet of glass or whatever I need or whatever's stored up there on a pallet, bring it down from the mezzanine and then be able to bring it along this corridor in 
to the extraction room or the honey house or wherever I'm working, because that's the whole idea is that the machine I'm going to buy will be able to fit underneath the doors and everything else as well as service the top of the mezzanine. So when I say service the top of the mezzanine, it only needs to be 20 centimetres clearance from the mezzanine floor on the top. That's the what we call the floor above or the top of the mezzanine from underneath. So we have to, we had to, had to be really careful because it's in French and I got that. <laughs> I didn't screw up on those um, terminologies, but yes. We call the height of the mezzanine the absolute top part where afterwards the, the ply floor is put down. It's actually aglo, you know, compressed uh, like MDF. So the, oh, on top of the MDF, that's the height. And that's going to be set to 3,100. In other words, 3.1 metres or 3 metres, 10 centimetres. So that'll be the height. Then the, mes the machine I've got uh, lifts to 3 metres, 30. And then it means that underneath the machine when it's down on the ground or just off the ground will give me approximately 50 centimeters of play inside the honey house inside the extraction room so that i can extract honey and use it as a slight lifting aid should i need to but don't forget i've got my other pallet track which is on the ground but if i want to bring something from the top of the mezzanine to ground level and then carry on with the same machine through I've worked it out that that would be the best option with the type of machine I'm looking at. So I'm getting a, a lift, in, in essence. It's a small set of forks, and I'm getting it for free. Now, I'll tell you why. Okay, In the quote for the mezzanine to put it up, they hire a forklift. And the cost of the hire of the forklift is 3,600 euros. So that's the way companies work. They don't think about the cost to you as a purchaser, they just think of the cost of supplying their service with the correct equipment to fit the equipment that they're supplying. And as far as they're concerned, 3,600 euros to hire a forklift, to have it delivered, obviously it's expensive, but for a week, that's what they have to do. So they put that into the bill. But once I bought this machine, it's actually under 3,600 euros to buy, the machine that I'm buying that will stay with me forever is exactly what they need because it does the same job as a, set of, as a forklift, but just slightly differently. In fact, it's probably more dexterous in terms of getting into areas because it's slightly smaller, but it does the same job as the forks. So I'm actually getting the machine for free in that respect because I don't have to hire a forklift and they've already okayed it, whoever I go with. Either of them have said it's fine. So I've got two quotes at the moment. I'm not sure which company I'm going to use because they're both good, but I think I'm going to go with the one that fitted the building, because they're very good, they're local, and I know them. They're actually a tiny bit more expensive, but they always get back to me. You know, when you deal with somebody and you feel right about it, that's what I found. Gut feeling goes a long way in a lot of things you can trust people. I know that it sometimes only goes so far, but long story short, all the things I've done so far to get to this point to get from a field to a working honey unit, or well, a working storage unit at the moment, soon to be a honey unit, this far has been a big journey for me. And I've learned that you have to trust people. And the people you can trust are the people that get back to you, that reply to you, that come back to you with different options. And that's what this company's done. So very long story short, all this waffling, I've got an electric lift, which is gonna come in probably two weeks which will then probably sit in the corner for most of the time. So just to talk about the machine, it's brand new, it's rated, all the European spec. The other problem I have, I mentioned it before in the previous video, is that if I wait to sign up for another company, they're gonna, sign, they're gonna sell me a, a machine like a Toyota or a forklift that is a very high spec model. Now that's fine if you're running a factory and you want it used day in, day out, all day, every day. In the end, I will probably use mine maybe once or twice a week at the most. Maybe more, maybe a little bit less. But the machine I'm buying is rated at that capacity. And that's what's really important is you buy a piece of kit for your business. So I'm only having to outlay about 3,000 euros for that machine delivered if I went to get a machine that was slightly higher, I couldn't get it under the door of the honey house. 
and then I'd be wasting my money because I don't really need it to lift anything higher. I thought of the option of having it to lift to four meters and that would be nice. Say for instance, I want to work up on that top rack up there, for instance, where that beam goes across. So I could put the pallet on the forks and put a ladder on it, then use the pallet to stand on kind of thing because we've done that before in other buildings. But for the extra I'm paying, the people at the, the, the lift place, absolutely fantastic. They're based in Germany, but have a huge selling in France. I've explained that to me that it's not really worth it. They, they've got loads of machines that are well more expensive than that. And they could have tried to sell me that, but they didn't. That's what I really like about it as well. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to buy the machine here that's rated for, for a smaller use, which is all I need. Why invest in something that can be seven or 8,000 when it's actually no different in parts and power of machine when it only literally lifts a meter more and I have to, and I, then I can't use it under the extraction room. So I hope you kind of understand that. You'll see from the drawing I've done, it explains the heights. Now, other people might say, well, why bother with all that? Well, to me, it's just what does it for me and I wanna have everything organized. It's very important when you're running your business so you know exactly what the parameters are of every part of the room. It also means that the internal height of the ceiling can stay at the maximum. So I get the maximum use of the pallet mover and the pallet lift, I mean, but also I can service this machine. If I need to take the top of that off, I've got plenty of room to be able to, because when you, if you have to take this top bar off to service it as a problem with the bearing or something, to take that off, I need to lift it the height of this beam here. So I've got to lift it another 17 centimetres to get that over that nut that is there. So, and also the ceiling inside, the mezzanine underneath will have insulation screwed to it as well. So I haven't got the figures here, but you'll see from the drawing, it explains it all briefly. And then you can see that with all that set up, I have a pallet lift that will take stuff off the mezzanine and operate in here and get under the doors. So it's a very, very fine dividing line, but it should work absolutely fine. You just have to take um, all the information sometimes and make a decision. There's no right or wrong. It's still quite a lot of money to shut out. Of course it is, but you've got to do what you feel is right with the resources you've got. And I, uh, if for instance, I want to put syrup into buckets, I, all that syrup can be on the ground now. I don't have to have one that when the farmer comes, he puts on pallets for me so I can get a bucket underneath this end to pour it out of. I can leave it on the ground all the time and I can lift that over the back of the truck if I want to and then just open and close the tap into tubs. The machine I'm getting will change my world in that respect. I can stack pallets neatly, one on top of another, and then they can go 15 high. I can stack all that kind of thing. I can service shelves in the workshop. I can service the pallet racks. So by that one machine coming, I can do all of that and, and I can move my syrup around and I can build the mezzanine virtually without renting a forklift. So that's a bit of a long winded description, but it kind of shows you when you just look outside and invest a little bit more in a, in a couple of things, that's gonna make a massive difference to me. So I'm gonna make up some frames now and then I'm off out this afternoon to do more transfers and to do more nukes and to do more apiaries, hopefully get another one done at least. We've got another dry day of dry weather, so on we go. I wish it was always this easy. Nice space in between each hive. Loads of bees in this box I've just smoked down. Look at the comb they built on the top. Look, it's unbelievable and it's full of nectar. I'm gonna to have to check this really carefully for um, swarm cells, but I might even eat some of that honey after. <laughs> Look at that. These are absolutely bursting, this colony. I'm gonna try and put my phone down and show you this colony because it's just lovely. But they're going into a hive. I'm doing all these transfers, the strongest ones first. I've done, I think, nine already, and I'm finding the strongest boxes doing them. I've got a load of the top to do as well. It's all kicking off, and all these hives are going to be moved out soon as well. So just loads to do. But I'll try and show you this transfer and see how we get on. Trying to kind of do the impossible here. Let me see how we get on going to get the first frame out but I'm going to lift the first frame out but I'm going to move the second frame 
over a bit to try and make a little, just a few a whisker of space, because sometimes you get some burr cone built inside on the older frames. Well, that's the perfect time to start. Look at that. There's our queen. Beautiful frame. This colony is packed full, there's drone brood. Look at this, the other side. This is the kind of nuke I love, but I'm glad I've got to it when I did. The most important thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check for queen cells. And there is the start of a cup there at the bottom. You can just see it there. And let's see what's in it. If there's nothing in it and the queen is still laying, she can stay. And that's how I work it. She's, the queen is still fat. She's not ready to fly. So this colony is safe at the moment if I give it space straight away. And that's how I work things. They're nice bees to work with hardly. Um, I've only used smoke just to clear them off the top. So I can, uh, I can show you, but it's just the kind of thing I'm finding not all the nukes are like this, obviously, but I'm transferring the strongest ones first. And there's a queen cell on the other side. Same place, but not advanced at all, just the very start of one. Just that she's just saying, this box is too full, we're out of here because we've got no room. I'm gonna do something about that. There's eggs in the cells that have just hatched and that's mm -hmm. what you need to do. You need to go to a place where she's laying and find and check there's eggs in the cells where you think she might be laying. And where is that? It's in the brood that has just emerged. So you go to a place on the colony where there's a patch that's just emerged from the middle bit of where she's been laying and it's all capped over. Check that there's those tiny little grains of rice in the bottom of the cells, but I mean tiny eggs, not three or four day old eggs that are gonna hatch and be larvae find eggs that have just been laid. If you know she's just laid and you've seen the queen and she's still fat, she ain't gonna go anywhere. Let me just show you in this box, I've got honey all over my fingers, so I'm gonna do my best not to cover the phone in it. But that's the kind of nukes I love. A little bit too strong, but they were going into the feeder above as well. So this is the ones I'm targeting today to remove. Look, at there's too much nectar in that, it's full but it's great. Loads of lovely bees. This is the Tenuta Retiro queen. Amazing queens. Take this one out. Loads of bees here behaving nicely. Loads of lovely brood. Look at that pollen. There's just nothing for these queens to lay in at the moment, unfortunately. So I've got to be careful. And I spy another queen cell there. So there is a place where the brood has been hatching. You can see that right in the corner there. And there's a chance if I just stop and move slowly, you might see the tiny eggs in it. But you can see that classic type of brood I'm talking about. That's where the queen would love to lay because she loves to lay immediately into the brood that's, hatched, that's just hatched. But also because there's no other room. So she'll be ahead of everybody laying eggs. It's there you want to look for the eggs. But we know the queen's in the box already, so we're not too worried. I just want to transfer the bees safely. I'm hoping that this last frame doesn't have brood on, so I can give them a frame to... No, I can't. It's six frames of brood. <sighs> and it's just crazy. So I'm going to put a frame of drawn... There's so many bees in this box, I'm actually going to make us. Gonna put a frame of drawn comb in the, sec in the second but one space. So if she wants to lay in that immediately, she can. And that might just halt things a little bit. I'm a little bit concerned because I found tiny queen cells, but look at that for an amazing nuke. That's what it's all about. So first of all, there's hardly any bees on the front, so I'll just brush these off. What I do is I knock the bees down in one knock so they're like, they're all in the bottom now. And if there's no other dirt in the box, I'll just pour them on, because it's quicker. Okay, empty box, clean. And when you get a big nuke like that, you very rarely have any dirt in the box. 
sometimes you do on the other size boxes if they're a smaller colony that hasn't had a chance to finish cleaning out the box as they grow but look at that inside that box is pretty spotless so i'm pretty pleased with that. so i'm going to find an older frame of drawn comb but hey that is the kind of frame i love clean this is what i call intuitive beekeeping you're giving the queen a little bit of a chance to lay straight away before the bees have got to build it so in that goes in the other three spaces that's the one i've added in the other three spaces i'm going to add foundation but that's what i'm doing here to all these where i find us the strongest nuke that's starting to go into the top of the box they're getting transferred we're moving out some hives very soon i've got a new apiary that i'm going to see sunday next week and i'm pretty hopeful that they'll be able to take 20 hives there straight away which is good and then i've got a lot going to the buckwheat this summer i may even run out of boxes because i don't know if i've got enough boxes to fill all the use all these nukes up uh if so i'll do some splits and make some queens and do some early splits and then make some queens for 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 these nukes so we'll just see how it goes but it's lovely i've got plenty of resources to use this now uh i this is the kind of thing you dream of as a beekeeper it doesn't always happen but it's all good news so there you go there we go that colony is lovely frame of foundation in that one drawn comb so the queen will have somewhere to lay pretty quickly before these guys have to build it up i have to uh, smoke this down now but otherwise there's two foundation there and there as well and that's the frame of complete honey that i've given them so there's a little bit more room now and long term there's more room but in less than three or four days i'll come back and i've got to add a load of supers to here and these will have a super then because they're gonna suddenly go oh actually we can go up after all so that's good that's on that's done masses of bees on that one really lovely colony really lovely queens and on goes the roof on to the next one these are all good here let's look at that amount of bees isn't that beautiful i'm pleased with that there's a bit of drift you can see those some of those bees are from there but this one was transferred just before as well that one's got to be transferred but it's actually a little bit smaller at the end this one's got to be done next you see how strong this one is as well the bees are coming out the feeder hole which is good Feel the feeder's full well not as full as the other one but there's still plenty of bees there good this is full as well not quite as full but within a day that will be the same you see have you got beyond the ball they just explode these nukes and this is another easy one to do for me because it's right next door to a space so all is good so yeah i've got some good bees here a lot of colonies to go into other apiaries to bolster other stocks and plenty for the buckwheat if it all works out well we could have a big crop this year i'm not quite sure what i'm going to do I, as I said before, I might well split some nukes and then make early queens with because there's loads of bees to make queens with and make some cell builders. And that'll be lovely to do. And I'll be doing that all here. So we shall see. Watch this space. But uh, lots of potential. I'm back out to the other apiaries tomorrow. And then into the week, we've got weather getting better, but there'll probably be a big hiccup. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday as the last system goes through before high pressure takes control for a while, which is going to be a massive boost for our honey crops. So, um, all to play for, everything to do, and all looking good. Catch you again soon. Bye for now.